Morning. Uh, lots of things to talk about today. Probably the biggest issue I know you all want to hear about is the state poem uh, controversy. No, I'm just. Um, what? Well, we thought about doing limericks, but then, well, we got away from. Had to invite Joe McDonald. Right. <laughs> well, let's not go there. A um, couple things. One mentioned. First of all, we did have a debate yesterday about uh, in the Senate about tax conformity, uh, which, of course, uh, we all support. Uh, a little concerned about the apparent, uh, apparently what's going to happen is this is going to get into a conference committee, a little concerned about that. We think this should be a little bit uh, on a faster track. But regardless, uh, we did offer some uh, opportunity for there to be an inclusion to deal with the marriage penalty, uh, which was uh, not uh, accepted by the majority. And this would have represented a significant amount of tax relief for married couples, uh, estimated by the Department of Revenue, about $114 per couple. Um, we think that's unfortunate in the course of all the things that we're trying to accomplish in fairness and, and looking for federal conformity that we did not uh, do that as well. So we're concerned about that. Uh, I think the other thing that was in that tax uh, conformity bill that was a concern was the change in the tax incident study, which is a little bit of in, inside baseball, but uh, uh, this is the thing that we use to analyze the effect of taxation on the people of Minnesota. And uh, we have had uh, a change that would take into consideration the effect of federal taxation on the people of the state of Minnesota. Uh, and they did insert some language to say they do not want to have that be revealed, which we find to be interesting given that that report is due, I think, next week. And so uh, we think that's curious that the majority does not want the public to know what the effect of the tax burden on the state of people of the state of Minnesota is when you take into consideration federal tax levels as well. So we think that is interesting that they're interested in having the effects of taxation understood as long as we don't take into consideration the effects of federal taxation. So we'll try to make sure that that information is made available to the people of the state of Minnesota. Uh, we also had a debate on the bill uh, to deal with federal Medicaid, expansion of the federal Medicaid program. Uh, we uh, did not uh, support that. Uh, the uh, concern is that, first of all, uh, this is a program that has lots and lots of uh, issues with it. Uh, it needs to be reformed. Uh, we have issues that with it as it is currently constructed. And as someone who's worked with that budget and passed, uh, lots and lots of constraints trying to deal with the federal requirements. To expand it further it makes it problematic when we're going to have to deal with our budget going into the future. So we have signed up to uh, take more federal rules, more federal regulations. They are guaranteeing some additional money, which is the attraction. However, uh, we offered some amendments to say, well, let's make sure that that money is going to be there. Uh, those uh, sunset provisions that would say if the money isn't there, then Minnesota would not be obligated to continue with the program. Those amendments were defeated by the majority, which leads us to believe that we're going to accept the obligations to pay for those things even uh, if the money isn't there. And that is a concern because that could be billions of dollars that the state of Minnesota, people of the state of Minnesota will have to assume and implement those federal programs as the federal government wants us to, rather than the way that we should be able to do that as a state. So we're very much concerned about that. Uh, there was some uh, movement on the health care exchange bill. I think it goes to the Senate to uh, the uh, full finance committee next week. Obviously, uh, we are concerned that uh, many of the amendments that we have uh, offered, most of them in fact, have not been accepted. At this point, there is not support for that bill. Uh, we don't think there's support outside of the members of the DFL caucus for that bill at this point. Uh, finally, uh, mention uh, briefly the budget, the governor's budget. Uh, uh, and I think you heard in the comments just previously, nobody supports his budget. Uh, nobody supports his taxes. Uh, uh, lots and lots of taxes, $3.5 billion of taxes, lots of sales taxes that nobody is supporting at all. I've not heard anybody say, yeah, we love the governor's sales taxes. Nobody's said that. Nobody's talked about that at all except as, well, there's got to be something done, and there clearly does. 8% uh, roughly increase in spending, and clearly there is a link that we need to tax more so we can spend more, but do we need to spend 8% more in our state budget given that that's not what the economy is uh, growing at, that's not what people's budgets are growing at? What is the reason we're going to spend 8% more? What is the great thing that we're going to do with this budget that justifies that amount of increase in spending? That's not clear. Uh, so the budget uh, 
is, uh, I think, uh, uh, a problem. And we haven't seen the bills. Uh, the budget was announced, what, a month ago? And there are no bills. I think we have one bill. We think we have the education bill. So it doesn't seem like the governor's budget uh, is very high priority, priority either for him or for the DFL majorities. They're not asking for the bills. They're not demanding that they be brought forward. They're not being introduced. Uh, so I guess uh, everybody thinks the governor's budget is sort of DOA, and we'll see what the majority does. All right, good morning. Um, this week in the House, uh, Republicans were, were also focused on uh, uh, protecting the taxpayers. Uh, we, we uh, obviously passed the, um, the tax conformity bill unanimously. We think that's something that's very important. Uh, we were actually hoping to get it, uh, um, get it to the governor's desk for signature. I know the Senate added some amendments that, that we're concerned about, uh, and I think at this point that's what's holding it up. Um, the IRRRB uh, restructuring that board to, to uh, take citizens off and put um, elected officials on is, is concerning for us. Uh, I guess we don't see how that fits in with this tax conformity bill. The governor had originally said that he wanted the bill on his desk, uh, I think, today. Um, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. I did call the governor yesterday and talk to him about this and, and my concerns with uh, the amendments that the Senate had made and uh, asked him to have conversations with the, with the DFL leadership. I also talked with uh, Speaker Thiessen and, and expressed my concerns. Um, you know, really what we need to do is pull out the political amendments and, and pass this bill. Uh, you know, Speaker Thiessen has been on the record numerous times saying that what he learned from the election is that Minnesotans want us to work together better down here. Um, and, and the first bill that we pass off the House floor passes unanimously. And now we're adding, uh, you know, political stuff into it. Uh, you know, taking a, a board that removes citizens and puts uh, politicians onto the board. Obviously, very concerning, and, and uh, um, so I'm hoping that the that the governor and the speaker uh, uh, can work on Senator Bach, and and uh, we can ultimately remove that. I I did offer to the governor that we'd be willing to suspend the rules um, to make this thing move quicker through the uh, um, through the conference committee process if we can get an agreement to remove the political stuff and just pass the tax relief that we've all said we want for for Minnesotans. So we're hoping that can happen. Um, uh, uh, Senator Han mentioned the uh, the, uh, the Medicaid expansion bill. Um, we obviously have the same concerns in the House, and, and we made an attempt to put the same amendment on to protect the taxpayers in, in Minnesota, uh, and, and that was uh, rejected as well by the DFL. And then yesterday we had uh, the state employee contracts uh, bill and, and uh, had had a, a debate that I think uh, was unfortunate on the House floor um, where the, the, uh, the majority was... Uh, you know, basically using procedural tactics to not hear amendments to the bill, which which I think is unfortunate, um, and uh, you know indicates. And I know uh, from your questions to the majority, I think we're going to have a conversation about the rules. <laughs> um, and obviously, I think we have a, a, a deep difference of opinion on on the impact of those rules. But we can see how uh, the minority operates on on bills uh, where those rules were not in place. The state contract bill was was obviously those those rules about the pre-filing amendments were not in place. Uh, our amendments were not political in nature. They were things that we thought were were good reforms for the state contracts, and uh, you know obviously uh, looks like that the DFL is is afraid to vote on our amendments, and that's really what this is about. Uh, and and frankly, that's unfortunate. And I think I think good policies uh, should be able to withstand the the criticisms on the House floor, and and uh, ultimately, I think. The, the, the system that we've used for the last 150 years to come up with uh, with those policies has worked, and, and you know we've got some concerns about why this is uh, why the rules are are being put in place. But anyways, uh, we also are looking forward to uh, next week seeing some of the governor's bills. We've seen the the K-12 bill. Uh, I've been asking on the floor every day where the bills are and when we can expect to see them. Uh, the K-12 bill is the only one we've seen at this point. Uh, there's been an indication now that the DFL, at least in the House side has the language for the higher ed bill, uh, the ag bill, and also the, uh, uh, now yesterday we just learned that apparently they have the tax bill, so we're looking forward to that being introduced. That's obviously the one I think that, that uh, is the big one and, and has the most uh, concern about it. So we're hoping that we'll see that next week, and we're looking forward to a, a good debate about the governor's tax plan. 
in, in the House, and I'll agree with uh, Senator Hannett. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of support on either side of the aisle for the governor's tax policies, um, but we'll we'll see what uh, what happens when those bills come forward. There's also a lot of unanswered questions about the governor's tax bill, and uh, I think once we see the language, that's why we're anticipating seeing the language so much, is we want to see uh, and be able to parse the the details of what will be taxed and 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 what will not be taxed, so uh, that we can have a real good idea of what the impact will be on, on middle class Minnesotans. So, um, also, obviously, a couple of special elections this week. We're, uh, we're excited to have those two members as well joining us, and, and uh, Representative Tamatice, uh, Representative-elect Tamatice, and, and Representative-elect Clark Johnson. Um, Tama will be a great member. I'm, I'm excited to have her joining us and, and look forward to them being sworn in on Tuesday. So, and I think we can stand for questions. Senator McGann, uh, Senator Bach said that uh, uh, he was expecting these gun hearings in the Senate uh, next week to be even bigger, draw more people than what the House hearings did, and he said there were concerns about uh, security in the Capitol. Uh, what have you heard along those lines? What are your thoughts about those hearings coming up? I've not heard any concerns about security. I know we've had uh, other debates at other times that have drawn a lot of people. I've heard no issues, concerns about security. Um, I will say that Personally, uh, I've gotten uh, quite a lot of uh, correspondence on the gun issue. It's been about five to one uh, people writing about concerns of uh, having Second Amendment rights be eroded by the bills that have been introduced. Uh, so uh, it seems to me to be a fairly uh, one-sided uh, correspondence, at least so far from what I've heard. So, uh, But I have not, frankly, heard a whole lot about the, uh, the gun issue, a lot more on sales taxes. A lot more correspondence on that, uh, and all of it negative. I've heard I've got anybody writing me saying they like the taxes. So. About the rally yesterday, at least a thousand people here for Freedom to Marry Day, and they were saying this is going to be the last one. That there were high expectations that a gay marriage bill will make it through this session. Do you agree with that assessment? You know, obviously. Uh, that is up to the majority. They can bring uh, whatever bill they want. I think, you know, from, from my perspective, and I've said this before, uh, I think what we learned from the election is this is an issue that deeply divides Minnesota. And, and uh, you know, I assume we're going to have a conversation about it throughout the legislative session. Um, but frankly, I hope that we can work on things that Minnesotans can agree with. And, and, you know, we think that balancing the budget without putting a further burden on uh, middle class Minnesotans everybody can agree that that's a that's a great priority and that we should be working on that. Will you take a caucus stance? The bill authors say they have support in both of your caucuses. Uh, I, you know, I, I uh, don't think that we will be taking a caucus stance on it. Uh, we don't typically do that. Um, we have not had a conversation about it as a caucus on how we'll deal with it. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, we'll, eventually we'll have a conversation, but there hasn't been a bill introduced yet Where at this point either. Um, you know, <laughs> at this point, uh, you know, I, I don't know that my own personal stance is, is very relevant. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share it. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Missouri Synod Lutheran, and I believe in, in traditional marriage. But, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly uh, would look forward to having a debate about the issue. And, and uh, you know, but, but I think it's something that deeply divides Minnesota, and I'm not sure that... Uh, that now is the appropriate time to have that debate. And I think, you know, we've had some switches in, in majority and minority, and, and everybody's figuring out their new roles. And, and I, I think what I've heard everybody say on the campaign trail and here in the Capitol is that we should work on things that we can agree on. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, divisive issues aren't things that, that we're going to make a priority and a cornerstone and a, uh, in this legislative session, I hope that we can really talk about things that Minnesotans agree on. And, and everybody is saying, you know, let's grow the economy, let's create jobs, let's balance the budget without putting a, f a further burden on middle class Minnesotans. Let's work on that stuff. Uh, your, your question about the rules uh, to, to the speaker, you know, was this mismanagement to not come together with the, the minority and, and work on something that, you know, could have made both sides happy? Absolutely it is. Um, you know, we tried numerous times to talk to him about other alternatives, maybe going back to a general orders uh, situation that the uh, that they use in the Senate. Uh, that's something we used in the House up until 98 or 99. Um, you know, that th the majority has been uh, set from the beginning that they're going to put this 24-hour uh, amendment in place. This is, you know, and I told the story on the House floor yesterday. I've told it in committee. Uh, 
10 years ago or so, I, I visited Washington, D.C. And, and was surprised to find out, because when you watch on TV, you think the chamber's full, and you think that every member of Congress is listening to the debate. It's not. There's nobody there. Decisions aren't made on the House floor in Washington. And with rules like this in place in Minnesota, decisions aren't going to be made on the House floor in Minnesota. And his argument that, that you know, we're, it's transparency, we're allowing people to, to see this stuff 24 hours ahead of time, that's a great argument. But the problem is you don't allow us to react to the input we get from citizens. I can't make, you know, every, every, almost every session we get emails, somebody gets an email. I got one yesterday from somebody who was watching the debate on the House floor that said, hey, I don't like this provision, you should do something different. Great. I can't offer an amendment on the floor to do that with these rules in place. We invite members of the public to come to committee and participate in the process. We invite them to give their input. And when they give input, we can't react to that input and actually put uh, an amendment in to change to change whatever their concern is? I mean, that's not, that's not transparency. That's fake transparency. That's telling the public, sure, we want you to see what we're doing, but we don't want you to be involved in the process. We, we want to put these deadlines in place that, that don't allow you to give input that can actually change the legislation. That's not, that's not transparency. That's wrong. And, and, and I already said it earlier. Obviously, this is because the DFL doesn't want to, to have to vote on our amendments. But if you've got good policy and you're putting good policy forward, your, your policy should be able to withstand that, that argument, that debate on the House floor. We've got a rich tradition in Minnesota, 150 plus years uh, of operating uh, under Minnesota style rules where we're inclusive. And now the DFL wants to move to Washington style rules where decisions don't get made in committee and decisions don't get made on the House floor. That's wrong. We're all deadline driven folks and you are too. You have all sorts of deadlines. Why is this deadline so much more evil than, you know, the first, second, and third committee deadlines or the deadlines to get your work done by a certain date outlined in the Constitution? Suddenly 24 hours is the end of democracy? Well, it, it, it's very obvious to see what, what's going on. I mean, I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday, and none of you did either. We can see, uh, you know, the political ramifications of why the DFL wants these rules. But it, it, it hurts the process, and it makes us more like Washington, D.C. And, and I think... You look at the, the approval ratings of Congress, and you can see that people don't think that they operate and function well. And it's, it's, it's just, well, we're, we're going to head in, in their direction, not in the right direction. And, and I have made the commitment numerous times, as has Speaker Thiessen, that we want to work together. And apparently the difference is I meant it. But, but when we, you know, put these kind of rules in place, what I see from the majority is saying one thing and doing another. And, and w w you know, we need to stop that. If he really means what he said, that what he learned from the election cycle was that he believes Minnesotans want us to work together, then let's put policies in place that show that. And, and this is not an example of that. In response to that rule, though, do you intend to withhold the required votes to pass a bonding bill from your caucus? Uh, I, I, let me answer that question this way. Um, I have said all along we're not going to hold a bonding bill hostage, but I will tell you that this rule has very much angered my members. So we haven't had that conversation yet. Um, I hope that's not the case. Uh, I don't want to play politics with a bonding bill. I want to I debate a bonding bill based on its merits and, and at the appropriate time, and, and I think we can still do that. But my members are very angry about this rule. Back to members, just for a second, you guys both uh, represent doubts that uh, it's going to be up to the majority to produce a bill and so on, but can you both give us a better idea of what your position is going to be going forward with this? Sort of active opponents of a bill passing, or sort of interested observers, or I mean, is it even on your top five or top ten list of priorities to block this from happening? Our caucus has not talked about it. We've not taken a position. We're not going to take a position. We're not going to force members to take a vote one way or the other. These are things uh, on this issue that people have to decide what they're going to do. Uh, but we have not spent any time talking about debating uh, marriage, uh, changing the marriage law. I think it's fair to assume that most of our members, if not all, are not anticipating or arguing for a change in the law. But we have not talked about it. Do you think it would be a detriment to your members if they voted to change the law? If they voted to change the law, yeah. I, I think that's something every member is going to have to come to their own conclusion about. Do you think the caucus would support those who would vote to change the law? When you say support, meaning? Elections. Oh, uh, 
I, I, I'm not aware of and don't anticipate that our caucus is going to be punitive to people based on votes they take. If, uh, I think people are elected to vote what they believe to be the right thing, and, and uh, 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 that's how I, th I think we should operate. So I don't anticipate there's going to be punitive actions taken against members based on how they vote, and I certainly don't support that. Recently in the House, no caucus position, no... Yeah. Mm -hmm. No punishment.